4. People of the Seine There were many ways of walking down to the river from the top of the Rue Cardinal Le Moine where we lived. The shortest one was straight down the street, but it was steep, and it brought you out after you hit the flat part and crossed the busy traffic of the beginning of the Boulevard Saint-Germain onto a dull part where there was a dull, windy stretch of riverbank with the Allauvin on your right. This was not like any other Paris market, but was a sort of bonded warehouse where wine was stored against the payment of taxes and was as cheerless from the outside as a military depot or a prison camp. Across the branch of the Seine was the Ile Saint-Louis, with the narrow streets and the old, tall, beautiful houses. And you could go over there, or you could turn left and walk along the quay, with the length of the Ile Saint-Louis and then Notre-Dame and Ile de la Cité opposite as you walked. In the bookstalls along the quay, you could sometimes find American books that had just been published for sale very cheaply. The Tour d'Argent restaurant had a few rooms above the restaurant that they rented in those days, giving the people who lived there a discount in the restaurant. And if the people who lived there left any books behind, there was a bookstall not far along the quay where the valet de chambre sold them and you could buy them from the proprietress for a very few francs. She had no confidence in books written in English, paid almost nothing for them, and sold them for a small and quick profit. Are they any good? she asked me after we had become friends. Sometimes one is. How can anyone tell? I can tell when I read them. But still it is a form of gambling, and how many people can read English? Save them for me, and let me look them over. No, I can't save them. You don't pass regularly. You stay away too long at a time. I have to sell them as soon as I can. No one can tell if they are worthless. If they turn out to be worthless, I would never sell them. How do you tell a valuable French book? First there are the pictures. Then it is a question of the quality of the pictures. Then it is the binding. If a book is good, the owner will have it bound properly. All books in English are bound, but bound badly. There is no way of judging them. After that bookstall near the Tour d'Argent, there were no others that sold American and English books until the Quai des Grands d'Augustins. There were several from there on, to pass the Quai Voltaire, that sold books they bought from employees of the left bank hotels, and especially the Hotel Voltaire, which had a wealthier clientele than most. One day I asked another woman stallkeeper, who was a friend of mine, if the owners ever sold the books. No she said. They are all thrown away. That is why one knows they have no value. Friends give them to them to read on the boats. Doubtless, she said. They must leave many on the boats. They do, I said. The line keeps them and binds them, and they become the ship's libraries. That's intelligent, she said. At least they are properly bound, then. Now a book like that would have value. I would walk along the quay when I had finished work or when I was trying to think something out. It was easier to think if I was walking and doing something or seeing people doing something that they understood. At the head of the Ile de la Cité, below the Pont Neuf, where there was the statue of Henri IV, the island ended in a point like the sharp bow of a ship, and there was a small park at the water's edge with fine chestnut trees, some huge and spreading. And in the currents and backwaters that the Seine made flowing past, there were excellent places to fish. You went down a stairway to the park and watched the fishermen there and under the great bridge. The good spots to fish changed with the height of the river, and the fishermen used long, jointed cane poles, but fished with very fine leaders and light gear and quill floats, and baited the piece of water that they fished expertly. They always caught some fish, and often they made excellent catches of the dace-like fish that were called goujons. They were delicious fried whole, and I could eat a plateful. They were plump and sweet-fleshed with a finer flavor than fresh sardines even, and were not at all oily, and we ate them bones and all. One of the best places to eat them was at an open-air restaurant built out over the river at Bas Moudon where we would go when we had money for a trip away from our quarter. It was called La Pêche Miraculeuse, 
and had a splendid white wine that was sort of muscadet. It was a place out of a Maupassant story with the view over the river as Sicily had painted it. You did not have to go that far to eat Goujon. You could get a very good friture on the Ile Saint-Louis. I knew several of the men who fished the fruitful parts of the Seine between the Ile Saint-Louis and the Square du Vergalon, and sometimes, if the day was bright, I would buy a liter of wine and a piece of bread and some sausage, and sit in the sun and read one of the books I had bought and watch the fishing. Travel writers wrote about the men fishing in the Seine as though they were crazy and never caught anything, but it was serious and productive fishing. Most of the fishermen were men who had small pensions, which they did not know then would become worthless with inflation, or keen fishermen who fished on their days or half days off from work. There was better fishing at Charenton, where the Marne came into the Seine, and on either side of Paris, but there was very good fishing in Paris itself. I did not fish because I did not have the tackle, and I would rather save my money to fish in Spain. Then, too, I never knew when I would be through working, nor when I would have to be away, and I did not want to become involved in the fishing, which had its good times and its slack times. But I followed it closely, and it was interesting and good to know about, and it always made me happy that there were men fishing in the city itself, having sound, serious fishing, and taking a few friteurs home to their families. With the fishermen and the life on the river, the beautiful barges with their own life on board, the tugs with their smokestacks that folded back to pass under the bridges, pulling a tow of barges, the great plain trees on the stone banks of the river, the elms and sometimes the poplars, I could never be lonely along the river. With so many trees in the city, you could see the spring coming each day until a night of warm wind would bring it suddenly in one morning. Sometimes the heavy cold rains would beat it back so that it would seem that it would never come and that you were losing a season out of your life. This was the only truly sad time in Paris because it was unnatural. You expected to be sad in the fall. Part of you died each year when the leaves fell from the trees and their branches were bare against the wind and the cold wintry light. But you knew there would always be the spring as you knew the river would flow again after it was frozen. When the cold rains kept on and killed the spring, it was as though a young person had died for no reason. In those days, though, the spring always came finally. But it was frightening that it had nearly failed.